so Belly, later this month, we have the 74th anniversary show live from the Chase in St. Louis. So it's a two night event. Um, what has it been like for you promoting and putting together a big double show like this? Well, the thing that uh, sticks out in my mind right away is that um, uh, Missouri, which is where the event is held in America, is a commission state, which is a, a which is a vestige of the old days where you have to everybody has to get uh, tested, blood tested, and everything. So to run an event in a place like Missouri is very very difficult because you should imagine if we have eighty wrestlers coming in, everybody has to be medically cleared. Um, and if that's not the that's not the condition in everywhere in America, so just that logistically, uh, as we like to say, herding cats to put on the show, uh, that alone puts a lot of stress on the company. Uh, of course, there's the travel and everything else, but the exciting part is bringing all these great talents together uh, on a couple of nights and putting on a kind of a super card for us. Um, that's a big thrill. And now that we're doing two of those a year, Crockett Cup being one, and then seventy four being our other signature event of the year. Uh, there's a lot of excitement in the company and um and we're just starting to roll out the uh, the announcement of what the card is going to be so that's that's fun too mm -hmm. well i saw um today that the bark invitational was announced so can you tell me a bit about that sure it's uh the second year we've done it we've done it it's a gauntlet it's an invitational so basically i think there'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 uh, top female talent competing for a championship shot the following night so whoever comes out of taya versus camille will face the winner of that uh, match and whoever is the champion, obviously, uh, they will have a chance to win a, a world title um, the following night. Uh, Camille likes to complain quite openly about the fact that uh, she's so good. I make her wrestle two nights in a row. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like, um, look, I'm wearing the uh, NWA Empower shirt. Uh, I believe the women uh, in wrestling are just as tough and durable as the men. And, and depending on the situation, they should be able to compete at the top levels. Uh, is equal or greater than um, uh, any of the men because um, that's how good they are. So, uh, yeah, I like I like it as a as a as a um, opportunity, particularly for uh, talent to step in in the gauntlet style, which is obviously a very difficult match to win. Um, so, yeah, so I love I love stuff like that for the NWA. I like sort of harkening back to the NWA's tough roots. Uh, the NWA I grew up on was very very tough, and you had to be tough minded and be able to deal with the physical uh, punishment of the gig, uh, as we would say in music. And uh, that's it. That's it. That's what the NWA is at, in 2022. We're, we're the toughest organization out there, particularly for America. Well, speaking of the women as well, you introduced the women's TV title. So why, why was now the time to have a second title for the women's division? Well, you know, you find yourself thinking about um, equal opportunity in a new uh, frame of reference these days, as you should. And uh, it's glaringly obvious that here we have a, t a TV title. It's just called the TV title. But it's not called necessarily the male TV title. And you start thinking, well, is it a TV title for uh, everyone or is it a TV title only for men? And then we should have a female only TV title. In the NWA, we do not do mixed uh, wrestling. Uh, the men do not face the women. Um, we have not done that one match like that that I remember in my four to five years of ownership. So it seemed obvious that it was a it was a glaring omission in our belts that we did not have a TV title for the women. Mm -hmm. You've also announced the an upcoming appearance from Mickey the Dragon Steamboat. So how did that come about and what does it mean for you to be working with him? Sure. I mean, you know, you you get hooked up into a network of people in wrestling who know different people and can book different people. And I was surprised that Mr. Steamboat was available to be booked because certain legends are under WWE contracts are not able to appear without WWE's blessing. In fact, we tried to book someone else whose name I, I don't need to mention. And unfortunately, WWE um, restricted their appearance, which is fine. If that's the if that's the business, that's fine. I don't have an issue with it. But um, I was surprised Mr. Steamboat was free to be able to come in. And so we were happy to book him for our TV show uh, in, in Nashville, NWA Power. And uh, anytime you have a legend uh, of the wrestling business step in the ring, um, and most notably, a true champion of the NWA. Um, it's a real thrill for the company because it's not just the fact that they're a legend, they extol the values that you believe in for the NWA and you're trying to bring that forward. So when you can combine those two things, it's very, very important to the company. With um, having the NWA name, how do you find balancing honoring the NWA's legacy and the nostalgia of it and fitting in with the modern wrestling world? Sure, that's a fantastic question. You know, when I first bought the NWA, um, 
because I'm a little bit older, I'd grown up with the NWA. Mm -hmm. I thought the NWA name would mean more to the general public, but unfortunately, the past 20 years of the NWA had kind of convinced people that the NWA didn't have a future. The NWA was still around, but it didn't have a future. So nostalgia really didn't carry much at all. Um, if it did, I guess we would have more of a representation of nostalgia um, because it would just be good business to try to pivot to something forward. Uh, but on the other hand, it didn't. And so we had to learn, okay, well, what is the NWA in 2022 now? Um, and of course, we've seen the rise of independent wrestling across the world, and most notably the rise of that through the, uh, through the being the lead series uh, culminated in AAW now being so successful. And of course, that combines with, you know, New Japan and things like that. So I think what's incumbent upon the, the NWA is to carve out a, a territory which is wholly its own. And what was strange to me about the journey was I didn't necessarily think I would circle back to the NWA style. I thought maybe I would be able to circle back to the NWA's historical place, but I've circled back to what I would call a more traditional uh, wrestling style, which is actually also very based in the UK style, mm -hmm. um, more rough, more rugged and more tough. And again, I think you see that particularly with our uh, female competitors, um, but certainly our heavyweights. I mean, I think we have eight to 10 top tier heavyweights in the NWA currently. Uh, I don't need to list them, but, you know, you start with, you know, a Trevor Murdoch, a Nick Aldis, a Tyrus, an Aaron Stevens, a Mike Knox, uh, Matt Cardona. You know, you have a lot of tough heavyweights in the, in, in the division. So I think we've circled back around in a very circuitous way uh, to the fact that the NWA is really going to be representative of the toughest standard in professional wrestling. And as we move forward, I think you'll see that more and more. And I would point people to, uh, if you're curious, to watch our, um, our television product, our junior heavyweight division, we have a weight limit of 225, which is very heavy for a junior heavyweight. So when you look at who's in the junior heavyweight division, a Kerry Morton, a Homicide, a Colby Carino, a Rhett Titus, a VSK, they're, they're wrestling a very, very rugged style for junior heavyweights. And, and that would distinguish us, let's say, on the open market between what other people are doing, which is more uh, high flying, high, high level of risk. Ours is sort of more rugged. Um, probably one step to the left of physicality for what would be a traditional X division, division match in TNA now impact. Well, you said there that the nostalgia didn't carry much weight when you bought it. And I've heard you mention before um, the comment that Jim Cornette made when you bought it about buying three worthless letters. And we're now five years on and NWA, you know, you're on YouTube, you're on Fight, you're part of a lot of um, big events and stuff. So how do you, like, how proud do you feel or how do you feel you've done in putting the NWA back in people's um, mouths and making those letters mean something again? Personally, I feel a lot of pride about it because I grew up with, you know, AWA, NWA, uh, WWA, being here from Chicago where I still live. Um, and that physical style, which of course extended in the Crockett, I would watch Georgia Championship Wrestling. That's the style that I grew up on. So to not only lead the NWA, but to bring that style back into the mainstream conversation and in essence, create a very competitive contrast to what is very, very currently trendy in professional wrestling. That means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I get a lot of kind of feedback from the wrestling talent behind the scenes who aren't in the NWA, but really enjoy the product because that's what they're attracted to, even though they might wrestle for a company that doesn't necessarily feature that style. That means a lot to me. But more importantly, I would point to anybody that, um, the NWA is just getting started in its new modern era. Um, you know, we're still built, we're still rebuilding something which, as Jim Cornette pro pointed out, was completely broken. Mm -hmm. And so to take something literally off the ground and dust it off and get it back to where it has respectability, it has credibility, we can run uh, pay-per-views that people will discuss and talk about. The results do matter. Um, that is super important in today's wrestling ecosystem. I mean, you're part of that. Um, you know, the digital uh the digital wrestling culture is probably more valuable than what would be traditional print culture, mm -hmm. particularly to wrestling fans. So making uh, gains in terms of credibility and exposure and uh, let's call it durability, uh, the fact that we're still here and we're still fighting and we're still growing and now we're about to put on our biggest shows ever. I think that says something about everybody involved, not just myself, that, that I've been able to enlist people who believe in the vision of the NWA and believe the NWA really does have a future. And that's now I, I feel like I'm at a point now where I can start talking about what that future actually looks at 
Like it's not just about, can we make it to the next year? Certainly the pandemic was very tough to navigate for me, but beyond that, I think we've done a great job um, just because we're still here and still fighting. And that's what you would want from any kind of baby face, right? You just want to fight out from underneath. Yeah. And we're still kicking out, you know? Well, you mentioned the pandemic there and it seemed to hit the NWA very hard because you had such amazing momentum before it. So what has it, the bounce back been like? And was there ever a point where you thought it maybe wouldn't come back? Sure. I thought long and hard about not bringing it back, not because I didn't care. It's just very difficult for me between my musical life and my wrestling life. And so the advantage of all that time being down, I think we were down about nine months or so. We still did some stuff, but we were down in terms of uh, normal television programming. It allowed me a lot of time to really think about, okay, well, what do I want to do here? If it's really down to me, um, if I have to choose between music and wrestling or my personal life and wrestling, uh, what is the commitment level that I'm going to have? And the positive side that came out of it is I was like, no, I really, really want to do this. This is really important to me. This is it probably even more important to me than I thought it was. And that time allowed me um, the chance to really think it through so that when I came back and I brought it back, I reorganized the company. I got way, way more involved on a daily level than I'd been before. And I think you can see the results of that now, not just my own participation, but getting other people involved behind the scenes. And I think that's really been critical. So in a weird way, taking a step backwards taking a moment to breathe because producing weekly television can be uh, exhausting in its own particular way um, has really allowed me the focus that I needed to bring it forward. And I, I, I'm as much as I don't like that time and having to shut down, I really think it was the, probably the best thing that could happen to us because uh, making that commitment has been everything now for us. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a couple months into working with fight and having power on there as well as being on YouTube. So what has that relationship done for NWA and why was it important to stay on YouTube as well for you? Sure. Well, when we first went with Fight, um, I guess about a year and a half ago, um, it was really important just to make a statement to the wrestling industry that we were legitimate, that we were going to sort of be in this ecosystem and that we were going to kind of float on the edges. Once we established a different rhythm with Fight and that, the, let's call it the professional side of that relationship, we started to realize also that that the audience that had found us on YouTube, that we weren't necessarily translating everybody over to Fight. And so we were able to work out a deal with Fight where we could kind of work both, in essence, try to draw more people into the Fight ecosystem and use Fight to draw more people back to YouTube. And so that's been a good thing for us. All our numbers have gone back up. And I think there's a lot of kind of good buzz around the product because people are able to access the product. Um, it's a difficult thing because, you know, at the end of the day, and it's been pointed out by many, many people, including Jim Cornette on down, that if you don't draw money from the television side and you don't sort of get enough television exposure, uh, you're going to have a hard time running a wrestling company, particularly in the modern era. We have definitely solved a problem of, of reach where anybody can find us at any time. And so that's very important. But certainly the financial side of drawing in money, uh, the YouTube model is fine, but it's certainly not lucrative. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm very focused on continuing to build what the NWA needs. If that means I have to sort of deal with the financial side on my own, I'm OK with that as long as the NWA continues to grow in people's minds as having the future. And I think we've definitely done that. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned Empower before, and you're wearing your Empower t-shirt, and that was such a great event. Um, what was it like for you promoting it and being able to put something like that on that um, showed off women's wrestling so well? Sure. Well, when Mickey was still in the, Mickey James was still in the WWE, um, she had expressed desire to, um, certainly she had pushed behind the scenes there for a, an all women's event. They had done one, but maybe that they didn't really follow up on it. Um, and she was frustrated by that because she saw momentum there. And now, now in hindsight, you realize Mickey was seeing the world that's coming. Uh, women's wrestling is, is just as big a part of the business. In fact, you could say it's, it might be a greater draw at this point in many quarters. Uh, Tony Khan just announced, or at least there came out, uh, they just uh, did a trademark for an all women's show or something. So this, this, this revolution on the women's side of the roster in professional wrestling as it pertains to the fans that it's only we're only in the middle of it or even in the beginning of it i think uh there's so much growth there to come so um when mickey came out of the wwe and she was poking around what what i would want to do and i remember this conversation that we had had i said why don't we don't run an all women's pay-per-view and she was kind of keen to do it and then i was like okay we need to make a decision like today and she was like whoa 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 i need more time and i was like no no we got, we're, we're going to do it we got to do it and we literally just cut, went out an hour later in front of the cameras and cut a promo in front of the live audience that said we're doing this we hadn't booked the date 
We didn't have a building set. We didn't, we, we, all we had was like, it's going to be this date and that's it. Yeah. And so we just literally jumped into the pool uh, without even being ready. Um, and uh, it was amazing. The, the response from the fans was fantastic. Uh, the response from the, uh, uh, the wrestling business was so positive. Um, and I think those things are really important. You know, I'm not the biggest kind of wave a flag type of person. Uh, I think you just do it. You know what I mean? Like whatever you believe in, you should just do. Like don't run around and talk about diversity. Be diverse. Don't talk about empowerment too much. Although I'm wearing the t-shirt, just do it. Just empower people, put people in positions of power. For example, one of our lead agents behind the scene is Medusa, who's an absolute legend in the, in the business. Okay, so you say, oh, okay, we got Medusa. No, we also have Jazz as also as an agent. So we have two of the greatest women talents in the history of the wrestling business. They work as agents for the NWA. That's a source of pride, but that's not something I would necessarily go out and talk about every five seconds because I don't need to. They've earned the spot. They're agents for the NWA as they should, but their voice is critical towards the product moving forward because they can tell me, hey, you're not quite getting the balance here right that you want. So we look forward to running another Empower event in the future. I think the most difficult thing, um, not that you asked the question, but the most difficult thing to try to run an Empower event is that there aren't enough female talent in uh, professional wrestling at this time. That revolution is still coming. Uh, I'm friends with Natty Neidhart, and Natty's gone on now to be, I think, the uh, has had the most matches as a female in WWE history. I think she's over 1,500 matches now or something like that. Might even be more. I'm probably, might even be just quoting the, the amount of wins that she's had. Natty, Natty and, and Trish Stratus and Lita and Melina, um, you know, and Jazz, you know, and so many other women, Medusa, have ushered in this era now where you're going to see a whole nother generation of female talent stepping up and saying they want to be in the business. Unfortunately, now the numbers are still disparate in that there's probably three to one in terms of male talent available to female talent available. So to put on another empower event is very difficult because now, now that women's revolution, uh, the, the revolution in, on the women's side of the roster is, is here to stay. Well, so many of the companies have signed the women up that were available and were top talent. So it's not like I could just make a call and there's like 800 people who are there to choose from. It's just not like that. So it's very difficult to build another event, but we look forward to doing it again. Well, on the event, um, you had AEW and Impact uh, Talent. How have you found in general like collaborating with other promotions? And do you think uh, cross promotion working together is something essential for the non-WWE companies? I think it's critical um, for social media. Um, you know, look, you're, you're trying to figure out a way to create headlines, create buzz. There's no easier way to do it than to put the companies together. I've been saying for years that all the non WWE companies should run a super event. Yeah. I, I know, I know that Tony just did uh, with new Japan did, did the forbidden door event, but if you actually put together a super event where, where it's MLW impact, NWA, GCW, you know what I mean? And then you have other people out there. And I'm not saying Ric Flair would wrestle again, but Ric Flair is an independent person. So if you got Ric Flair on the show, you have Ricky Steamboat on the show. There's a lot you can do. And I, I think people would be shocked at how big a number an event like that would draw comparatively to WrestleMania. Um, I think the numbers would be staggering. Um, so I continue to sort of make the case for that. That said, to the earlier part of your question, it's not the easiest thing working with other companies. And it's not because they're difficult. They just have their way and you have your way. And sometimes trying to put those things together are difficult, not because of anything other than it's just everybody's trying to balance their own concerns. Um, but I, I particularly as a fan enjoy stuff like that. I love it when we're able to do stuff like that. I love that we've had like, for example, at the Power in Power show last year, Adana Parazzo, who was then the Impact Women's Champion, defended her belt on the show. I love stuff like that. And I love it for the NWA because that is the NWA's roots is was as a territorial company that represented all sorts of different companies. So I like to point to the idea that maybe we're almost in a modern version of the territorial system yeah. where, you know, everybody kind of represents their own world. And then under certain circumstances, you put those things together uh, for historians in the crowd. I mean, there were times where um, I think it was uh, superstar Billy Graham wrestled Harley race or something or, or Bob Backlund and one was the WWF champ and one was the NWA champ. I mean, there were things like that even in the WWE's past. Mm -hmm. um, and there might be a point now that Triple H is running things where he might be open to, to events. I, I know they've been very friendly with the NWA since I bought the company. Mm -hmm. uh, Triple H just made no secret of the fact that he's an old school NWA fan. So there might even be a situation where the NWA could work with the WWE. Now, I'm honest in saying the WWE does not need the NWA 
but there might be a thing there where by opening those doors, the, end, uh, the WWE might find there, there's a different audience that would come in than the historical WWE audience because of the history of the NWA, because of the media, and that might provide an opportunity for them that would be attractive. So mentioning a Triple H there with Vince retiring, like for you, what was your reaction to that? And do you think the, the landscape will change for the better with Triple H? As you said there, he does seem to be more open to things than- Sure. Well, I'm just going to talk about it from the wrestling side, because obviously the, the allegations are very, very, um, you know, difficult to navigate. And um, and uh, it's, it's unfortunate on so many different levels. So let's just talk about it on the wrestling side, because that's the one thing that I know. Uh, people who people who have disparaged and and not liked the WWE product over the last few years. Uh, and, and certainly the criticism has been very vocal and, and it's been it's been off talked about. Uh, there's a there's a yes to that. And me as a fan, I didn't necessarily find that was much in the product for me personally. Um, but that said, um, the WWE is now the most successful wrestling company as Vince McMahon leaves. Uh, it is the most successful wrestling company in the history of all of professional wrestling. That's over 100 years. So there might be forces and tidal waves in there that we can't see on the outside when you're dealing with stock prices, when you're dealing with huge corporate entities and billion dollar television rights deals. In essence, they may have made a decision that they wanted to be more conservative in wrestling product to satisfy other masters in a bigger uh, financial ecosystem. So whether or not Triple H will pivot the product into something resembling more, let's call it a modern take on professional wrestling, that remains to be seen. There's some early indications there. Um, I, I will say that um, I think that uh, just my own sense of it is that a Triple H will be a little bit more pugnacious as it comes to letting other companies take shots at the WWE. I, I think he was part of that, that uh, you know, the Monday Night Wars. You know, there was obviously the famous thing where they showed up in the tank outside WCW. I think that was very much in the spirit of that core group, uh, you know, um, and uh, and so it wouldn't surprise me if if where for years the WWE as a corporate entity has kind of remained silent, where other people have kicked in the shins. We may find under under Triple H's reign that they that may not be the case. You might see a different type of retaliation, and I'm not talking about corporate subterfuge. I'm talking about just not taking it on the chin and being quiet about it, um, because. You know, it is wrestling, and 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 fans might actually enjoy a little bit of jostling back and forth. Mm -hmm. Do you find, and with the way the wrestling business is, and you can kind of get away with saying more in wrestling as you know, a promoter and like taking shots like that. And is it are you re received differently in the music industry if you say something negative, you know, about another musician, whereas in wrestling, it's like it's just wrestling. If you you know that, do you know what I mean? Sure. Well, I used to cut wrestling promos back in the 90s on other rock musicians and people did not like it at all. Um, I took a lot of criticism back, including by journalists for saying what I was saying. I sort of thought it was all in kind of good fun. You know what I mean? Um, you know, we've all grown up with Liam and Noel talking shit about each other. Um, I always thought it was it was a bit of good fun, you know. Um, most people in, in music are extremely sensitive to that type of criticism. Now, that we live in, let's call it the woke era, you never know where something innocently said is sort of a joke will be taken and spun out of control. So I think most people are remiss to say anything at all. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it goes back to the old axiom that your, your mother used to say, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. I think professional wrestling is built on heat and heat's not a bad thing. Um, so certainly, you know, for example, since uh, uh, Tony took over and, and, and brought the AEW uh, to prominence, He's taken many shots, both subtly and overt, at the WWE. So that's kind of what I'm trying to say. You may find now in a different culture with different leadership that they may start firing back in a way that, um, you know, AEW hasn't had to take from, you know, a, certainly a bigger company. So you might see some of those those things start kind of kicking up now. But I would say that's not necessarily bad for business. Yeah. Uh, in the music industry, before your purchase of NWA, what was the reaction to your wrestling ambitions and like your appearances on ECW? Were you ever told by people high up in music to maybe like knock this wrestling thing on the head and leave it? 
Yeah, uh, many people thought I was absolutely crazy, that I was hurting my brand, um, that I shouldn't do it. Uh, go as a fan, but don't get involved. It's a bad look, all that type of stuff. Uh, I used to tell people behind the scenes, like, uh, and I'm saying this in the way I would say that so people can take it how they want. I didn't, I didn't become a rock star to have somebody tell me what to do. Yeah. It was antithetical to my thinking. Um, I get it on a business level, maybe now that I'm a little bit older, but I still kind of don't care. I think people should do what they want to do. I think they should follow their passions and their dreams. To, to, to leave the NWA uh, literally up out of the dust now for five years, you have to really be into it. You have to really want to get up every day and hit that thing hard. You know, I'm answering hundreds of texts a day, hundreds of emails a day. I'm having meetings all the time on Zoom calls like we're having right now. Um, you have to really care. You know, I have two little kids. That's time away from my family. That's time away from me writing a song. So I have to be able to turn to my bandmates, my business partners in the music side and have real credibility. And the thing that's happened that's been very nice over the last five years is everybody in my life now, including journalists, you could say by extension, on the music side, now treat my endeavors in wrestling very, very, um, uh, uh, what would be the word, respectfully. Yeah. Uh, it's no longer seen as this weird hobby, curiosity, what the fuck are you doing? Now it's sort of seen as like, oh, okay, that's important to you. You've done a good job. We'll just kind of leave that alone. And sometimes even people ask just nice questions like, how's it going? And they'll include those quotes in the, in the music articles just because it's part of my bigger world. So that's awesome, right? I'm able to bring music fans over sometimes to the, to the wrestling side. Who's easier to deal with, music, press, or wrestling journalists? You know, I think that wrestling press, um, like the music press, is oftentimes chasing the gossip side of it all. But I think the wrestling press is more in lockstep with the rhythm of the business on the wrestling side. They understand this. There's a lot of moving pieces. Rock journalists tend to be a little bit more living in the clouds about the reality of the business. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you a quick example because I don't want to belabor it here. But um, there's a common thing in music, which is like, um, oh, you're a rock star. Your life must be so wonderful. All you do is sleep all day and get high and roll out of bed and play a concert. And oh my God, you care about selling records. And oh my God, you care about what somebody said. Why should you care? You're a star. It's like this weird, they project their fantasy on you. And if you don't live their fantasy, they look at you as something's wrong with you, but you're actually the person they wish they would, would be. It's a, such a weird thing. Um, I mean, I used to talk about sports, just, you know, I'm a Cubs fan li living in Chicago baseball and, and people would be like, you like baseball? Like, like kind of make the face like, yeah, I grew up liking baseball. Now that I'm a famous person, I get to go to the game, sit in the front row. Like what's so like, it was like, like, isn't that a cool thing? Like, you know what I mean? It was like, people would treat it as if it was like anti-rock or anti-cool. And I was like, what are you talking about? So yeah, I would say wrestling press is a little bit more clued in on on what it takes to be successful in the wrestling business where on the rock side it's mostly just fantasy and it's always about navigating their version of your fantasy well as a musician in wrestling you must get asked a lot of wrestling entrance music questions but uh, for you what do you prefer um the kind of in-house mid themes like jim johnson stuff or the way we see tony khan now buying some themes like Baltimore for Jungle Boy. Like, what, what do you think is better? Um, personally, I think it would be better for wrestling if you're able to use more popular music. The difficulty there, and I'm speaking now from the artist side, is is if somebody approaches me about that, well, I'm not giving it away for free. Uh, for example, I'm in negotiation to try to license a very classic rock song for the NWA for the N uh, NWA 74. And hopefully by the time this interview airs, I'll have secured that and we'll be able to put that out. But just dealing with behind the scenes, the music publishers, the artists, of course, they want what they want and the money side, which is totally fine because I'm in that position all the time. So I don't look down on it. But from a wrestling side, it's very difficult sometimes to navigate that. So if you're Tony, you go out and just buy the rights and do what you got to do. Great. Um, I'll tell a quick story. Um, one time, uh, Tommy Dreamer, 20 something years ago, uh, when he was going into WWE after ECW, he wanted to get the rights for Man in the Box by Alice in Chains. And he knew I knew Alice in Chains. So he said, can you do something? So I reached out to Alice in Chains and they said, okay, talk to these people. And we'll try to make it happen. Anyway, so uh, it came back with some astronomical figure, which obviously the WWE was never going to pay. 
And so that's why Tommy ended up in, in the WWE with sort of like the man in the box, but not really theme. Like it kind of sounded like man in the box, but not really. But I actually had tried to get him the thing and I couldn't be, you know, I couldn't look down on what the band wanted for the theme because it's look, it's going to be on a TV show. It's the WWE. But back then, WWE was never going to pay that kind of money when they could just have somebody write something similar ish. Yeah. Did you like the WCW like ripoff themes as they were called, like the Jericho's Even Flow and? <laughs> well, as a musician, I always look down on that stuff, you know, because <laughs> um, I've had music ripped off many times. Uh, none that I can think of in wrestling off the top of my head, but certainly for commercials. Like sometimes I'll be sitting at home and a friend will DM me some Italian commercial where some guy's riding in some no game mini car, and it's like sounds like one of my songs, but like they've ripped my song off. That stuff happens all the time. Um, and you have to get lawyers involved. So I tend to look down on that type of stuff. I mean, I get it, but I think at the end of the day, it's sort of disrespectful to the musicians. It's, it'd be no different than somebody rip, ripping off a finish, right? You know what I mean? Like, like, hey, I'm not doing, you know, I'm not doing your DDT, I'm doing mine because I put my pinky up or something. I don't know, it's, it's, it's the same vibe for me. Mm -hmm. And well, as we wrap up here for people who haven't uh, given NWA a chance before, you've got such a big show coming up. What what can you say to maybe entice them to tuning in to the 74th anniversary shows? What I would say, and I like to say, is if you're a fan of professional wrestling, um, that means you care about the entire wrestling ecosystem. You want to know what everybody's doing. You want to know what all the top talents are doing. And then you want to sort of see the world from afar. Like you want to be able to look at what WWE is doing, AEW is doing, New Japan. Well, we're part of that now. Mm -hmm. And so I think you want to give us the chance to see why we're different, why people are talking about us, and then make your own decision about whether or not that's complementary to that, that which you already like in professional wrestling, or you think that's just not for me. I think uh, the lazy tag on the NWA is kind of an old school thing. I think that's very, very incorrect. And I think through the years, we've proven we're getting um, more and more modern, not only in our approach, but in our thinking. Um, so I think this is a world-class event that competes with anybody. And it's two days, you know, a lot of stuff's going to happen. Um, yeah, I think you know I have seven, seven to eight titles on the line, so there's a lot there to uh, to uh, to take in. And if you're a wrestling fan, you want to be there because you never want to miss these things. And this is a big event. Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's the 74th anniversary of the oldest professional wrestling company in the world. If you're not into that, I don't know what to tell you. Absolutely. And where can they check out NWA now? Sure. Um, follow us on Fight. Um, you can subscribe if you want first run programming and then you get access to all the pay-per-views for free once you become a subscriber. I think our it's $50. And so that's basically like if you were to buy both nights of the pay-per-view, it'd be like buying a whole year of pay-per-views. So it's a great deal. Uh, and then if you want to watch our show, NWA Power, that's Friday on YouTube. And Saturday, we have NWA USA, which is the second show, which is a little bit more features cruiserweights, other talent, and also younger talent. So we're very proud that program's come a long way in the last year um, and has become actually very competitive now with NWA Power. So we're very proud to present both these programs. And now we're up to, I think we're 100 hours of programming a year now, um, counting the pay-per-view. So that's a big step from what did, what did he buy per Jim Cornette to 100 hours a year of programming. So we're very, very proud of what we're doing. And, and yeah, I always say to people, and I said the same thing to people in my musical life, pay attention now because you're, you're going to look back later and you're going to see that the things that you're watching now are vital to where we're going. Thank you so much for talking to me. Um, yeah, thank you for your time today.